Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our live show. I hope you're having a great uh, weekend. Uh, you can invite a friend or take a friend for us uh, to uh, learn together. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate uh, your support. Um, today, I just wanted to share briefly like uh, some di different types of uh, education and uh, the spiritual, the personal, academic, professional, and financial. Uh, and sometimes we wonder why we, we, we we're not successful uh, in life, but uh, for us to be successful, we need uh, all, all the, uh, types of education. You can, uh, if you succeed academically, but you're not uh, financially intelligent, you find you may not, you may be surpassed by someone who may not be as uh, equally educated, but they they have financial intelligence and they've pursued financial education and uh, they, they do well in life. So we need to be in a position where we are an all-rounder, spiritually, academically, personally, uh, professionally, and financially for us to be successful. Uh, when one of our shows, uh, Temba, taught us that uh, to be financially free, we need financial intelligence, uh, financial plan, and to financial um, uh, discipline. And all those things, we get them as we uh, develop our financial education, as we pursue our fin financial education. Sometimes uh, it's one area that we take for granted. Uh, no one is really born uh, financially um Intelligent or financially uh, um, educated, we have to pursue pursue it uh, so that we know how to uh, make money, manage money, and multiply money. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki says financial freedom is a mental, emotional, and educational process. Uh, any news that you wish to bring to our attention uh, to the attention of our viewers, Timba? Yes, yes, as usual. Um, there are things that I would want to say before we talk about the topic today. The first thing that I would want to say, Tafazo, you would know that in this week, there was an inauguration ceremony for the president in South Africa. I think it happened on Tuesday um, this week. But what caught my attention was the response of the market soon after the inauguration and the performance of the markets afterwards. So what we saw was a situation where the rand went below 18 to the US dollar after a very, very long time. And before I came on to this show, I actually had a look at the performance of the rand. It's still trading below the 18 rands to the dollar uh, mark. So, and the reason for that is uh, the markets were actually encouraged that after his inauguration, we're going to have business friendly policies, especially after the coalition with the, with the DA. The JSE All Share Market Index also responded quite positively. Soon after the inauguration, I think we saw the market going above the 18,000 mark which it hasn't done for a very long time. Now, I think it was trading just under 80,000. So since then, the performance has, has, uh, has gone down. A similar reaction was noted on the bond market as well. In fact, of the bond issuance that happened soon after, I think one of the bond issuance was six times subscribed. Why am I mentioning all this? I'm mentioning this to drive a key point, especially with regard to investments. Prior to the conclusion of um, the coalition arrangements, I think we were talking about political uncertainty. And we were also, at the beginning of the year, we were also talking about political uncertainty, especially as a result of the extraordinary number of elections that will be happening globally this year. But there is an important lesson to be to lesson to be learned, especially for, for investment purposes. 
And this is the lesson. Normally, stock markets do not respond to political uncertainty and economic uncertainty. What tends to happen in most cases is that because of political and economic uncertainty, some investors tend to panic. And because they panic in the process of selling their investment as a result of the panic, they end up losing quite a lot of money. But if you look at history, the history of elections, whether it's in America or it's in, in South Africa, because when we do investments, we do quite a lot of research and we go back into history. Because in most cases, what happened historically could be an indicator of what may happen in the future. So when we study history, the history of elections in America and in South Africa as well, it's quite clear that the stock market soon after the election has actually gone up. And that's something that we must be mindful of at all times and not and not really, really uh, panic. So that's one of the things that I just want um, to highlight. Don't change your investment strategy. Don't panic as a result of political uncertainty. If you are to make financial progress in life, particularly as, as, as far as investment is concerned, you need to be in there for the long haul. You need to have a long stem strategy. Elections will come and go, but markets will also be there. And in most cases, there is no direct correlation between political uncertainty and the performance of, um, of markets. What was very interesting to me, Tafadzwa, around the market reaction is that in a, in a, in a very long time, if you analyze the markets in South Africa, Normally, markets respond to good news that comes from global happenings. Most of what influences the JSE is as a result of global happenings. So what we saw on Tuesday was a good news story happening in South Africa, influencing the market. And I hope that it's going to be good news for South Africa going forward. But regardless of the fact of whether it will be good news or bad news, as an investor, you need to have a long-term strategy. Don't change your strategy as a result of uh, economic or political uncertainty. So that's the first thing that I want to highlight. The second thing that I want to highlight is what the banks have been saying, particularly with regard to debt cancelling arrangement. Shafadzo, you would know that in the past year, interest rates have been rising and in the year before that. And a number of consumers have been impacted on their finances as a result of the rising interest rates. And quite a number of consumers have actually applied for debt cancelling arrangement. If you are listening to us outside of South Africa, a debt cancelling arrangement is where you officially register yourself in terms of the National Credit Act for debt cancelling. You're basically saying, I'm overly indebted. I can't keep up paying my debts, so I need protection from, from creditors. And so you go under a, a legal arrangement. But what banks have noted is, number one, there has been an increase of debt cancelling arrangement. That comes as a no surprise because the interest rates are very high. But also the opinion from some banks, in fact, the major banks in South Africa, is that consumers are entering prematurely into this debt cancelling arrangement. In other words, we've seen a group of professionals marketing themselves as debt cancellers, and sometimes they would want us to go into this arrangement not necessarily in the interest of the consumer, but in their interest because they would want to collect fees from the debt cancelling arrangement. So the one thing that we're saying there, based on what the banks are saying, there are two things that we're saying. The first thing that we're saying is before you consider going for a debt cancelling arrangement, talk to your bank. I think banks, because of the increase in indebtedness among the consumers, they are much more prepared to give you waivers in terms of 
both interest and capital payments. So talk to your banker first, talk to your bank first before entering into a debt cancelling arrangement because some of these arrangements are not always in the interest of the consumer. Secondly, just consider the benefits and the downside of entering into such an arrangement. One of the things that we need to bear in mind is that once you enter into a debt cancelling arrangement, there is a huge impact on your credit score. So your credit score is hugely impacted and you won't be able to have access to finance in a very, very long time. In fact, I was actually considering a case of somebody who went into a debt cancelling arrangement for a year. After they had gone into such an arrangement, there wasn't a significant improvement in their overall indebtedness, but they had paid something like 9,000 in fees. And, and that's potentially what can happen. So I'm not necessarily discouraging anyone for filing for debt counseling. I'm just saying, get advice, get professional advice. It must be a considered discussion with your financial advisor. After, obviously, you've spoken to, 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 to your bank. But let's also not forget that the debt counseling arrangement is a very important mechanism to protect your assets. The third thing that I would want to say, again, this comes from some of the comments that I have seen concerning what is currently happening. And it's around the prescription law. Let me ask you something, Tafadzwa. Um, Tafadzwa, are you aware of the prescription law, the debt prescription law in South Africa? I'm just I'm just asking you on the spot. I know you we didn't discuss this before, but are you aware of the debt prescription law in South Africa? Ah uh, no no not yet. Not yet. I'm yes sorry. yes. Yeah. After this discussion, you'll be aware. Most consumers are not aware of the debt prescription act. The debt prescription act basically says, Tafadzwa, if you borrow money from anybody and they forget about that debt. In other words, they don't ask you about that debt for three years. Then that debt prescribes. Um, a prescribed debt is basically an old obligation that the consumer has not acknowledged you know, in terms of indebtedness and they have not paid within a three-year period. When we say that debt prescribed, we basically mean that the creditor has no right legally to claim that money from you. So let me explain it easily so that you understand, Tafadzo. If you get money from the bank, for example, and let's just look at a scenario where the bank does not contact you after you getting that money, and within three years, you do not contact the bank, you do not acknowledge that you owe the bank, after a three-year period is, uh, is passed, the bank has no right to collect that debt from you. The debt is prescribed. In other words, it's written off. There is no legal obligation for the debt to be paid by you as a debtor. Why am I talking about the Debt Prescription Act? There have been unscrupulous creditors and unscrupulous banks that have continued to collect prescribed debt from consumers because the consumers are not aware of this debt prescription law. In other words, they are not aware that debt prescribes. Obviously, normally what happens here is that a debt collector will phone you, and one of the things that they will do when they phone you is, do you acknowledge that you owe the, the creditor, this amount of money. Once you say yes, it interrupts the prescription. So what we are seeing more and more is clever debt collectors who would want the consumers to acknowledge the debt so that um, the debt does not prescribe, right? And also once you commit to pay, um, then there is an interruption in the prescription. So here are my two tips to consumers, particularly those consumers that are overly indebted. I know all of us, if we are overly indebted, we feel a moral obligation to pay our debts. But let's just let's just understand here. 
we are aiming for debt freedom. Whatever loophole we can exploit legally, we would want to exploit legally. So if somebody who is overly indebted don't have this moral obligation, particularly to financial institution, to pay off your debt, if the debt is prescribed, there is no obligation, there is no legal obligation. So let's distinguish your moral obligation to pay debts and your legal obligation to pay debts. Once the debt is prescribed, there is no legal obligation. The second thing that I would want to give as a tip to everyone who is overly indebted is that be very careful when you converse with the debt collectors, particularly debt collectors collecting on behalf of banks. I don't like telephone conversations. Stay away from telephone conversations. Don't commit anything on uh, on, on the phone. Just ask the person to put it in writing. So they will ask you questions such as, do you acknowledge that you owe the financial institution this amount of money? Would you want to make an arrangement? Just say to them, can you put it in writing? Because some of these debt collectors will phone you at very odd hours. In fact, they know that the most likely time that you're going to take the call is early in the morning before you start your work. So they will phone you early in the morning when you're going to work. Uh, and part of what they would want to do is to get you to a point where you interrupt the prescription. And sometimes they will phone you after work when you are at home, because that's also a likely time to reach all those people that owe money. So my tip to you is that particularly for those long outstanding debts, because I'm not speaking to somebody who is not overly indebted. I'm talking to somebody who is overly indebted and you owe the world quite a lot of money. If you are in that situation, there is hope for you. There is hope for you. You know, don't be guided by a moral obligation to pay the debt. I'm talking about debt to the financial institution. Obviously, if you are owing a friend money, you've got a moral obligation to pay off that amount. I'm talking about borrowings from banks and borrowings from companies. We have to pay because there is a legal obligation to pay. So just be aware of... Um, of this prescription and ask all your creditors to put things in writing. So that's the other thing that I would want to say. Let me go to global news, uh, Chafatso. There are two things that I would want to say which caught my attention. I think two days ago, there was a newspaper report of a very, I think it's the most, it's the wealthiest family in the UK. They are an Indian family called the Induja family. They have got, I think they stay in Switzerland. By the way, most billionaires who have made money will stay in Switzerland. Um, I'll tell you one data for why people prefer to do that. But the Swiss financial system is perceived to be the safest, um, the safest financial system in the world. But that's besides the point for now. Um, so what this Induja family would do is that they would take domestic staff from India because they are originally from India. Um, in fact, I think they own one of the prestigious hotels in the, in the UK, um, the Raffles Hotel, I think it's the Raffles Hotel. Um, very, very prestigious hotel. So they, would, they, they didn't treat their domestic staff very, very well. In fact, they would really abuse them. Um, that's what the allegation you know, was actually saying. Um, to such an extent that um, during the court proceeding, I think there was a statement to the effect that this family was spending far more on their dog than on the domestic staff. Why am I mentioning this? I'm just mentioning this as part of the ethics that we must have, particularly on our journey to financial independence. Don't abuse people. Sometimes I come across people that are making money that abuse their workers, that abuse the people that work in their homes. It's not a good thing to do. It's not, you know, don't get to a situation where money causes you to, um, to not look at, 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 you know, your workers as people deserving of um, a dignity or a dignified treatment. So I normally 
do not speak well of people that are wealthy, but who abuse or mistreat other people. I think to me that's a no, no, no. As far as the ethics of you know handling money is concerned, you don't have to be nasty. You don't have to abuse or mistreat other people. So the end result, Tafadzo, was that I think four members of the Induja family were jailed between four to four and a half years. We're talking about billionaires here. Yeah? Obviously, they're going to appeal the sentence, and it would be interesting to me what happens what happens during the you know the appeal of of that sentence but to me the learning there is always treat people right you know pay people their fair wages even the people that work for you um that's part of the ethics of handling money and then in this past week um Tafazo, let me ask you my last question you know of microsoft obviously I think in the past few months, we've spoken about Microsoft. They are the most valuable company in the world. Um, have you ever heard of a company called NVIDIA? NVIDIA. Uh, just in passing, but not in detail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot deliberately, Tafatsa. Uh, it's it's just part of the things that we do with the Tafat. I also didn't know the Tafat, so 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 don't feel bad. I also had never heard about this company called Nvidia. Never heard of them. But the reason why I'm mentioning them is that in this past week, that is uh, just that we have just concluded, Nvidia became the most valuable or the most expensive company uh, in the world. Before that, Microsoft was the most valuable company. Before Microsoft, Apple was the most valuable company. So some of the valuable companies that we have in the world are companies such as Google, Microsoft, and Apple. You know, those are the valuable companies that we have. But then there is this company that came from Norway in the past week to become the most valuable company in the whole world. Now, when you look at it, it doesn't surprise you why they became the most valuable company. It's because they are primarily involved in the manufacture of the chips that are used for artificial intelligence technology. So think of chat, chat GPT. For chat GPT, for that technology, that artificial intelligence technology to operate, you need certain chips. And so they are the company that manufactures those particular chips. Um, I think I was looking at their stocks just a few um, minutes ago, a few hours ago. They are no longer the most valuable company in the world. But at some point this week, they became the most valuable company in the world. Two things that I would want to mention which are relevant to all of us. Sometimes making financial progress in your investment portfolio, and we've said this time and time again, has to do with you doing your research and investing with companies that are going to do amazing things for the future. We've always highlighted artificial intelligence, the green revolutions as some of the trends that are shaping what will happen in the world. So some people have made a lot of money, lots of money in investing in this NVIDIA company. Because if I knew about them, and I was doing my research on companies to invest in them. Anybody doing interesting things on the artificial intelligence front, uh, particularly if they are successful, their stock price would go up at some point. So that's the first thing that I would want to say. Always align your investment portfolio with companies that are going to do amazing things for the future. Point number two, now that I have told you about NVIDIA, some of you are going to go and look for the stock and try to invest in that company. It's too late. It's really, really too late. The, the thing about investing is that you buy low and you sell high. So if the stock price is high already, there is not much value that you're going to see in the future. So if you're still interested in a stock like NVIDIA, wait for it to go down. And then if they are promising to do amazing things in the future, then you go for it once it's gone down. 
you do not want to buy when the stock price is high because you're not going to make a lot of money. Let me stop there, Tafazo, so that we can go into what we need to talk about today. Uh, thank you for that insight. Yes, I've also realized that uh, whenever people talk about a stock that's uh, uh, lucrative, normally the price is, uh, is not reachable. So um, I'm sure I'll not make an effort to look uh, at NVIDIA. Uh, on the prescriptive, uh, dead prescriptive law, is it the same uh, issue like what the... Uh, traffic uh, fines here uh, in South Africa, where if one doesn't pay traffic fines for, I think, five years, they write it off? Is it like the so same? So all debt prescribes after three years. All debt prescribes after three years, whether it's debt arising from what a financial institution has given you, or it arises out of municipal debt. So there are conditions for prescription, Tafazo. We're not saying after three years, and you haven't, you know, you, after three years of you getting my, you know, uh, then the debt prescribes. Debt prescribes on condition number one, that during those three years, you have not acknowledged to whoever you have borrowed, you know, money from that you owe the money. In other words, you do not acknowledge. In other words, they suddenly go quiet. Secondly, you yourself have not made an attempt to pay this debt within those three years. So if you have made an attempt to contact them and to pay, then you are effectively acknowledged that you owe that money. But debt prescribes after three years generally, and, and that's the law of prescription uh, on those two conditions, Tafazo. Uh, thank you for that uh, clarification, because uh, I think it, um, it was a, it was going to give like a false hope, I guess, when people think uh, as long as you don't pay for a certain period of time, then you, you write off the, the debt. Uh, but yeah. uh, today so, we so are So what it also means, if somebody owes you money, uh, make an effort to track them. Uh, so that the, the otherwise, if if they do not acknowledge the debt or or they don't make an attempt to pay, uh, that's why you will hear some creditors say just pay a little amount or you acknowledge that you know about this debt. Once you say yes, then the debt continues. You have interrupted the prescription. So if somebody owes you money, do something within those three years to interrupt the prescription. That's essentially what we say. Ah, okay. No, at least was there was someone who is owing me now. I was getting a bit concerned, <laughs> but I have been following up. So, <laughs> so there is hope for payment. Okay, today we are continuing on the topic of trust that we started last week. Uh, Timba, would you start recapping on the key points that uh, we covered last week? So last week we defined what a trust is. We spoke about the advantages and the disadvantages of trust. We spoke a little bit about um, how trust can be used within the context of estate planning. But under the definition of what a trust is, we basically said a trust is a legal arrangement whereby control over property is transferred to a person or an organization. And so you transfer ownership to a person, and we called that person a trustee. So you, as the founder of the trust, you transfer control to another person or another organization, the trustee. And you do so for the benefit of someone else, and that someone else is the beneficiary. So the trustee then would control the trust assets, and the beneficiary would acquire you know, the full vested ownership obviously in accordance with the provisions of the trust deed. So the document that gives rise to a trust is the trust deed. Um, for you to set up a trust, you must just make sure that the objective is not illegal. So you cannot set up a trust for illegal purposes, which some people have done. Then that whole trust is, is illegal. 
generally in terms of trust law trusts do not are not people you know a company is a person it's a legal person you are a natural person a, a trust is not a person it doesn't have a legal character although as we shall see for the purpose of taxation a trust is there for you know just for the purposes of taxation regarded as a person for the purposes of paying tax but in essence a trust comes as a result of a trust deed but it doesn't have a legal personality you can terminate a trust you know by written agreement um on a debt that has been set you know out by the founder or if the trust has achieved its its objective and and one of the reasons why we're talking about trust i will talk about the advantages of trust later on is just to make all of us aware of the advantages and also make all of us aware that it's even possible to register your business in a business trust called a trading trust. I know of people who conduct business in the form of a trading trust. So this is information that we're just giving to people so that you know what your options are. So instead of registering your company with the company registry, you can actually just conduct this business um, in the form of a trust. Obviously, it's on condition that your main objective is conducting business and that the trustee will manage the assets of the trust for, for, a, pro, for a profit. One of the things that we mentioned uh, last week is that in South Africa, there are generally two types of trusts. Um, let's just call the one type of trust as a living trust. We called it an inter vivos trust. And then, you know, that's a trust that is created between living persons. Then the other trust is a testamentary trust, which is de basically derived from the valid will of a deceased uh, person. I remember particularly, Tafadzo, I remember you asking questions, a question, you know, are trust only for the wealthy? In other words, are trust only for wealthy people? I think we did clarify that question. Why list trusts are commonly associated with wealthier individuals? You know, they can be useful to anybody. Um, obviously, if the circumstances warrant for the creation of a trust, um, we just need to be aware that in creating a trust, I think we highlighted that number one, you must seek legal advice. Very, very important to seek a legal advice. We made it clear last week, Tafadzwa, that our advice is that you must you must involve somebody who is knowledgeable on trust law, knowledgeable on tax law, in the creation of a trust. Because I have come across people who create trust, and then within a few years they reverse the decision because they can't keep up with the cost of maintaining a trust. So so the point is. Trusts are not for wealthy individuals only. Um, you just need to make sure that at the point that you are creating a trust, you've got a sufficient asset base that warrants um, the incurrence of the costs associated with the trust. But in my view, if the circumstances warrant for you to create a trust, um, it may be advantageous for you to do that. We spoke about estate planning. And the point that we were making there, Tafadzwa, is that once you accumulate wealth, or even for everyone, one of the things that you must do is to plan your estate. And trust could be very, very useful in estate planning. In other words, the trust can protect your family wealth. Um, it can preserve your legacy for future generation. By the way, from the discussion that I'm having with you, I think you can begin to see that trust can be created for various purposes. We have had people who have created trust for charitable purposes. Um, so it's called a charitable trust. We've had people who create what is called a special trust. Maybe a special trust would have the objective of taking care of a disabled child, for example. We also spoke about a business trust. 
Um, so trusts are created for, you know, for various uh, purposes. But one of the reasons why we must consider the creation of a trust is preserving your, 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 your legacy for future generations. And that's particularly beneficial in the event of a liquidation, in the event of a lawsuit. Anything can happen if you are in business. And sometimes you need to protect your legacy. Um, you can be sequestrated as an individual because you have accumulated so many debts. Once you have transferred assets to a trust, those assets are protected. Um, you can also divorce. So sometimes one of the areas of conflict in a divorce is the distribution of assets of, 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 the, of, the, of the couple. Um, some people have used trusts to protect certain assets from, from divorce. So, so those assets that are part of a trust will not be subject to uh, the divorce uh, proceeding. Um, a trust may also be set up to provide for your dependents or your relatives, and, you know, affording them financial security. So those are all the things that um, you would need to take into consideration. Last week, Tafadzo, you started off with a, with a, uh, with a verse from the Bible which basically says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So you can also create a trust as a viable vehicle to benefit your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren as the eventual beneficiary of a trust. So one of the things that we mentioned last week is that to give effect to that biblical scripture, the vehicle that you can use to be able to um, to do that is is a trust. So we have seen people who set up a trust for the benefit of minor children. Um, sometimes those children won't be able to manage their inheritance. Um, so you create a trust uh, for that. We spoke about a number of advantages of setting up a trust, Tafadzo. I will not mention all the advantages now, but some of the advantages have to do with privacy. So if you want privacy, as far as your financial affairs are concerned, um, you do it in the form of a trust. So there are people um, who would want their affairs to be, um, to be private. So what normally happens with deceased estates is that deceased estates by law must be advertised in a government gazette. Um, so, and that applies to wills as well. A will can be, you know, made as a public document so that anyone who may have a claim against you can come forward and have that claim settled upon your death. So if you want privacy, you know, that's a way of doing that. Another advantage that we spoke about is minimizing your taxes, particularly your estate duties. Um, Obviously, you're not going to set up a trust solely for the purposes of minimizing your taxes. I think you need to have uh, other objectives apart from just minimizing your tax objective. Because as I will explain later on, compared to individuals, tax, you know, trusts are taxed at a higher tax rate. Um, so in South Africa, trusts are taxed at 45%. Um, but what we are talking about here is that once assets have been donated to a trust, they cannot be subject to estate duties, you know, for example, and therefore you are able to ensure um, continuity. You can also use trust as, you know, another advantage of using trust that we spoke about last week is for the purposes of estate planning. So if you want to distribute your possessions effectively, you know, trusts are considered as ideal vehicle to do that so that you can prevent mismanagement of your, of your, of your inheritance. So you've got trustees that you trust who will administer control over those assets and protect the assets and ensure that the assets are used for the benefit of your, of your beneficiaries. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, trust ensure continuity of assets. I think that's one of the things that we we mentioned um, last you know um, last week. We went on to talk about disadvantages of trust. 
So one disadvantage is that once you put assets in a trust, you do not have ownership over those assets. So, so there is loss of ownership. Um, although a founder can also be a trustee. So you can be a trustee. I think we mentioned this last week. Not the only trustee though, but you can be you can be a trustee. Um, the other disadvantage that we spoke about relates to costs of setting up a trust. Um, I think I mentioned a figure north of 12,000 rands, just to give an indication of the type of costs that you can be incurred. And you asked me a question last week, Tafadzwa, where are the costs coming from in setting up a trust? So, and the obvious area where the costs come from is number one, auditing the, uh, the accounts of the trust. Because by law, in South Africa, trust must be audited, but also in paying the advisors for administration of a trust. Um, there could also be a tax disadvantage of a trust, because I mentioned that in South Africa, um, the top in, 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 in income tax rate applies for a trust. So trusts um, are taxed at 45% um, in, in South Africa. Um, and capital gains sometimes may be applicable uh, for 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 trust. So those are some of the um, those are some of the the disadvantages. But for those of you who are listening, um, there are plus, there are pros, and there are cons for creating a trust. That's why you need advice. But this is a very very useful um, estate planning, tax planning um asset protection vehicle that you need to be aware of obviously as you set up a trust there are things that you must be always be aware of um you need to be very specific about naming who the beneficiaries are um, there have been cases where people are vague in um, in naming who the beneficiaries are and this has given rise to legal disputes I'm sure you've, I've also been advising people, particularly the beneficiaries who are disputing over, you know, who, are, who they have got a conflict over, over the assets that were left in a trust. Uh, although I don't understand how siblings would be at each other's throat, there should be a way of resolving some of these issues. But if whoever set, whoever has set up the trust is quite specific about naming the beneficiary, Sometimes it limits the legal disputes that may that may that may arise uh, there. One of the biggest difficulties in setting up a trust is selecting who the trustees who the trustees would be. Um, you know, the trustee is somebody who obviously has to act in your best interest for the benefit of the beneficiaries. So it's, it's, it's an onerous position. Um, so a trustee has to be somebody who is up to the challenge and who is willing um, to, to do it. So my preference is to involve professional trustees rather than just involving somebody because you just trust them. Because sometimes they, you know, it, it could involve quite some administration, you know, there, there is administration that is involved, um, you know, there. Um, so, so that's, but that's a, that's a significant um, decision. Generally, you'd want to make a trustee, somebody that you trust who will act in your best interest, somebody who is very knowledgeable about what we're talking about. So that was just a recap Tafazo, of what we spoke about last week. Uh, thank you for reminding us and for the recap. Uh, Tendai is asking, can you change a beneficiary if a situation changes and do you pay for that? So obviously you pay as and when you, you know, I, I advise that you involve lawyers um, in setting up a trust. You involve professional people. But yes, um, you know, that can be changed as well. So the answer is yes.
Uh, okay. Uh, we spoke briefly about text treatment of trusts. Can you elaborate on this? So here, again, the purpose of this response is not necessarily to give tax advice. Um, so, so, so that's not the purpose. But the purpose is just to highlight that we must be very careful in setting up trust and we must receive you know, advice from people who are knowledgeable. Trusts are accountable for tax. In South Africa, just to illustrate, you know, companies pay a tax rate of 27% in South Africa, but trusts have to pay a tax at 45%. So generally, trust, the income tax rate for trust is much, much higher than for, for companies. Uh, in fact, that's sort of the, the highest income tax rate. And compared to individuals, you know, your trust does not qualify for any of the rebates that are mentioned in our income tax act so one has to be very very careful you know so that you don't end up paying unnecessary taxes um you know as a result of trust third point that i would want to highlight number one um income that has been generated by a trust generally is levied at 45 uh, percent which is the the highest um, um tax rate the second bullet point that I would want to mention is that trustees may allocate income and capital to multiple beneficiaries um, so that sometimes you can have a situation where the income is vested um, to the beneficiaries. So, so it's not in all cases that income will be taxed in the hands of the trust. In some cases, because depending on the circumstances, you know, depending on how the income has been distributed, whether that income is, you know, is, 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 is uh, you know, depending on how it's been distributed, you can have situations where the income is taxed in the hands of the founder themselves, in the hands of the beneficiaries, or um, in, the, in the hands of the trustees. So it's not all, in all cases where the income will be taxed in the hands of the trust. Um, it just depends on how the income has been, has been distributed. Uh, I spoke about special trust. Um, a special trust is, is a trust that is set for a specific purpose, like taking care of a, dis a disabled child. So we need to distinguish between a normal trust and a special trust. Um, special trusts are taxed at a sliding rate, you know, just in the same way as individuals will be taxed. So in South Africa, individuals are taxed on a sliding scale of 18 to 45%. So, so, so that would be um, applicable for, for special trusts. And, and sp some special trusts um, also... Um, can have certain exemptions from, from capital gains tax. So that's with regard to income tax. Let's talk about capital gains tax. Just to remind our listeners and our viewers, capital gains tax is what is paid uh, with respect to you know, uh, tangible assets and also for investments. Uh, you, you pay capital gains tax. And it's calculated as the difference between the proceeds that you get for the sale of the asset and what the Income Tax Act refers to as the base cost. All right. So that base cost, you know, could be the original amount that you purchased the asset uh, for. So generally, um, trusts are taxed at 45% of 80% of the capital gain. If you were to compare that with in, with an individual uh, or with special trusts, uh, they would be taxed at their marginal tax rate, but on only 40% of the capital gain. And the point there that I'm highlighting, there are two bullet points. Point number one, trusts indeed are subject to capital gains tax. Point number two, even with regard to capital gains tax, trusts are taxed at a higher tax rate. We spoke about estate duty. Um, once assets have been donated to a trust, a tr there is no estate duty that is payable 
uh, there. But you could have situations, especially if the founder is setting up a trust, a testamentary trust, you could have a situation where the trust assets uh, are subject to you know, estate duty. So it's something that would need to be considered before the, the, the trust is set up. So that's with regard to estate duty. Um, then there could also be donations tests you know, donations tax. In South Africa, donations tax is paid at a rate of 20%. So if you transfer assets into a trust, in other words, you are a donor, uh, donations tax may be applicable there. So it's very important that you consult a tax professional uh, on the implications of uh, donating um donating an asset to, to a trust. You do not want to trigger donations tax, but there are ways of doing that. I know of people that have um, loaned money to a trust, for example, as part of minimizing taxes. But, but the purpose of this is not to give tax advice. It's just to be aware of how tax would be, would be applicable. And then the last uh, category of tax that I may want to talk about is VAT, value-added tax. So in certain instances, trusts may be required to register for VAT, for value-added tax, particularly if the trust is engaged in commercial activities. Remember earlier on, we spoke about business trust. So, so you know, VAT may be applicable. Um, and currently, you know, VAT is you know, is, is levied at the rate of 15% in South Africa. Um, there are other considerations as well. So I've spoken about tax considerations, but one of the things that has happened with regard to trust is that some people have used trust to disguise ownership, the beneficiary ownership, uh, but also um, to, to be involved in money laundering transactions. So trusts have to adhere to certain additional disclosures. And this, we are talking about anti-money laundering requirements related to beneficial, you know, beneficial ownership. Um, and, you know, trusts are required to submit returns to uh, the tax authorities regarding the distributions that have been made to various, um, to various uh, beneficiaries. So, I think that's all that I would want to say at an elementary level, at a basic level, with regard to trust, Tafazu. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, how does uh, one go about registering a trust? And is there any other information you may wish to add on trust? So we've spoken about different types of trust. To me, um, when you decide to register a trust, it's crucial to determine the type of trust that basically suits your needs. Uh, there are different types of trust. So, so it's very, very important um, to, to be able to, uh, to choose the right type of trust. I've come across situations where people are, are not advised properly. And so they go with a particular type of trust only to change it at some stage. And when you change and you try to undo what you have tried to do, which is the question that Tendai asked uh, about changing beneficiaries and so forth, it, that involves costs. So once you try to undo what you have tried to, you, you did originally, that may involve costs. So before we even talk about registering trust, um, Let's just be clear that before you embark on that process of registration, you need to, to determine the type of trust that best suits your needs. Now that you have done that, um, let's just reduce it to steps. In fact, let me, because sometimes people want, you know, step one, step two, step three, you know. So when you are setting up a trust, um, Remember what I said there, one of the crucial decisions is choosing a trustee. So let's just say step number one, choose a trustee. That's a very critical decision, 
right? Because a trustee is the person that is responsible for managing um, the assets and ensuring that it meets, you know, its 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 objective. So, why list you can be a trustee? My advice is that you appoint at least one other independent trustee to ensure impartiality. Um, so in terms of the law, the trustee must be a natural person. So step number one, choose a trustee. Step number two, choose a name for your trustee, for your trust, right? You know, that could also be an important, you know, aspect. I actually like a name that reflects the purpose of the trust. Um, it shouldn't be misleading. It shouldn't be um, um, obviously offensive. Um, uh, try not to have people associate the trust with yourselves. Um, um, just try to choose a unique name which complies with legal requirements. I guess that's that's what I'm trying to say. So choose a trustee, choose a trust name. Then step number three, draft the trust deed, right? The trust deed is 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 the legal document which basically sets out the terms and conditions of the trust. Um, it would go into detail on things such as the powers and the responsibilities of the trustees, you know, the rights and the entitlements of the beneficiaries, you know, the purpose and the objectives of the trust. You know, drafting that trust deed can be a very complex you know, process. That's why my advice is always seek professional assistance either from a lawyer or from from somebody who is a specialist in this in this area so once you have drafted that trust deed um you can then go to the next step so we've said um we've said step number one choose a trustee step number two choose the name of the trust step number three draft a trust deed step number four appoint your beneficiaries Right. So you need to consider the needs and the circumstances of, um, of, of your beneficiary. Write the trust deed in, in a way that it is flexible to accommodate changes in circumstances and that the trust deed allows for addition and removal of beneficiaries is necessary. Right. So, so that's very, very important. So going back to Tendai's question, um, uh, it's very important that at the time of drafting the trust deed that we do so in a way that is flexible to allow for addition or removal of beneficiaries so that it's something that can be overseen by the, by the trustees. So now that you have determined your beneficiary, step number five, you then register the trust. Trusts are registered with the master of the high court. So unlike companies, you know, companies are registered with the company registry. Um, in South Africa, that would be the CIPC, the company, that's the company registry, you know, here. But the master of the high court is the official responsible for overseeing the administration of, of the trust. And it's a question of going to the Department of Justice website you will actually see that there are documents that need to be completed there. Um, you would need to submit your trust deed. You would need to complete an application form um, and, and other documents uh, as well. If I remember very well, um, apart from the application form, you would need to, um, to have um, an, a, 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 an acceptance of trusteeship uh, you know, yeah, completed um, an acceptance of auditor application. Remember what I said, um, you would need documents such as the beneficiary declaration, um, you know, things such as certified copies of, um, of, of the trustees. Um, obviously, trustees cannot act as trustees until they receive confirmation from the master of the, of the high court. Um, so that was step number five. Then step number six, you then open a bank account for, for, for the trust. Opening a bank account, it's, it's essential. It's an essential step in managing the financial affairs. Then step number seven, you then transfer the assets to the trust. And then step number eight, you then maintain and manage 
the trust. So once the trust has been registered, the assets have been transferred, the bank account has been opened, it's then important to maintain and manage the trust you know, effectively. Um, trusts have to keep accurate records of the financial transactions. So again, our advice is you know, seek professional as, you know, assistance in managing the affairs of, um, of, of the trust. Um, so that's all I wanted to say, Tafazo, about, about registering um, a trust and administering a trust. Um, let me stop here. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Timba, for that uh, comprehensive uh, information. Uh, I think with our time, we have come to the end of the show. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I saw a sister joining us from Abu Dhabi. We appreciate uh, you joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, if you want to get in touch uh, with Temba, uh, you can connect with him at his, on his LinkedIn uh, account, and his name is uh, Temba Mazbuko. You can uh, also follow uh, him on uh, his YouTube account, finding, uh, managing your finances like a black belt. And uh, you can write us an email to tafazwa at tafazwamazbukospeaks.co.za. You can also check out our website, www.tafazwamazbukospeaks.co.za. And I also got a YouTube account that Trundar is worth fighting for. Again, we appreciate. Let's continue um, developing ourselves financially and uh, growing our, uh, developing our financial education so that uh, we, we have better fin we have, uh, financial intelligence. Uh, let's grow together. Your dream is worth fighting for. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Cheers. <laughs>